Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Gamer Citicom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with Zen 2 and the 7nm process and its performance, and then we're going to move over to Zen 3. So, starting things out with Zen 2, then, and this 7nm process, one of the early questions we had after the Next Horizon event had concluded was regarding the 25% performance uplift, using the same power, of course, compared to the previous generation of TSMC's node. Early reports using TSMC's own data were that we could expect up to 35%. So what happened there? Like, what happened to the 10%, damn it? Well, there were a lot of theories. Perhaps there was a typo. Perhaps uh, TSMC's 7nm process wasn't quite as good as originally anticipated. Maybe there was a miscommunication. It could have been a dozen things. But ultimately, none of those things have proven to be true. And this is according to Mark Papermaster over at um, AMD. Speaking with EE Times, he confirms that with TSMC's original statement, it was utilizing a simple circuit design to almost like a proof of concept. But of course, AMD are producing much more complex designs with, let's say, Zen 2 or Vega. So the reality is that 25% is more like real world performance, whereas the 35% was once again using a simple oscillator. Whereas once again, the 35% was a simple device like a ring oscillator. Here is the quote. TSMC may have been measuring a basic device like a ring oscillator. Our claims are for a real product. Moore's law is slowing down and semiconductor nodes are getting more expensive and we're not getting the frequency lift like we used to get. Looking ahead, a 7nm plus node using extreme ultraviolet lithography will primarily leverage efficiency with some modest device performance opportunities, end quote. So what we have there, of course, is a couple of things. The first is information concerning Zen 2 and yep, and according to AMD, their figures are much more like real world products, which is great. I am happy that they are using, of course, real world data, and that does give us a much more faith in their numbers. But we also have some information there concerning Zen 3. What they're essentially saying is that Zen 3, which is using what they are considering to be a 7nm plus node, is going to focus primarily on efficiency with a modest performance uplift. So almost certainly, whatever IPC gains we end up with Zen 2, and once again, it's looking to be about 10 to 15 percent on average, with you know possibly more with certain workloads. I have a full video up with going through all of the rumors, all of information, along with what has been officially confirmed by AMD. I'll link that in the video below, uh, video description below. But with uh, Zen 3, this is not going to be the case. What they are going to do is focus on possible leakages in the silicon, perhaps uh, lower the power consumption, lower heat output, and so on and so on, which will have several benefits for different markets. Even in the server market, you obviously don't want to put out more heat than what is required. You don't want to consume more energy than what's required because, well, those things A, cost money, and they B, are difficult to cool. But it also benefits things such as laptops, things such as small form factor devices, because quite clearly a laptop battery life is imperative. And even half an hour or an hour's battery life can be a, a massive difference if like you're in a convention or whatever, and you need the extra like 30 minutes or hours battery life and you just look at the battery and go, like, oh no, not now, please, there's no power plug, no. Like those things are really important. So most likely we're gonna see a mild IPC bump, probably them just fixing small things that perhaps developers or themselves have noticed like oh well if we do this and tighten this then perhaps we'll get a modest bump i don't know if it'll be like zen to zen plus or anything like that it might be a little more and possibly we'll see mild clock speed bumps as well as mark himself pointed out you don't see the huge clock speed leaps that we used to get. We are now, of course, scaling into a wider design where we don't necessarily go with like massive clock speeds. That was 
uh, situation that Intel, and fa Intel found themselves in, excuse me, with the netburst architecture. The Pentium 4 stopped at around the 3, 4 gigahertz mark, depending on whether you go with the Extreme Edition chip and so on. But they had originally thought it was going to go way beyond that, I believe up to 10 gigahertz for memory. But of course, there were issues, and that's one of the reasons they had such a long pipeline with that particular chip. And then, of course, to their credit, they did something really smart and they introduced hyper threading. But we were also making huge die shrinks back then, huge process leaps. And of course, now it's not like that. Processes have become a lot more efficient. They have become a lot wider. In other words, we have a lot more execution cores. We've got more CPU cores on a piece of silicon. So they are much more uh, multi-threaded compared to what they used to be. So all of those things combined with just plumb better efficiency. They're better at actually predicting what instructions are going to be uh, needed next. They are better at actually executing those instructions and so on. So all of those things together do help to keep Moore's law alive. Plus, of course, we are seeing other things like <laughs> as we, uh, the glue or infinity fabric, as AMD probably prefers to call it, uh, and that ability to actually have massive dyes and massive pieces of silicon communicate to one another with buses. So uh, Mark Papermaster did touch on the fact that they will be using uh, EUV for the 7NM Plus uh, architecture. And what this basically means is that currently silicon is created or rather chips are created using ultraviolet light. This ultraviolet light is then used to actually slice inside the silicon itself and create the various structures within. With EUV, extreme ultraviolet light, the wavelengths are considerably smaller, not a lot more narrower. So what you can do, of course, is pack a lot more uh, information, or a lot more circuitry, excuse me, into a denser area. And yes, that is an extremely simplified version, exactly what EUV does, because I don't want it to swallow up a large portion of the video, exactly how lithography and the you know various uh, CPU pro manufacturing processes occur. But it gives you enough to kind of have a jumping up point if you do want to do some research yourself. Either way, it's going to be fascinating to see exactly how AMD's roadmap uh, pans out, because once again, we know Zen 2 is going to be released next year with Zen 3 following, and then we have Zen 4 and so on and so on. And for me anyway, there are a lot of burning questions. And ultimately, all we can do is play, of course, the wait and see game. Speaking of the wait and see game, I feel that it's also very good to talk about another piece of news from Intel. And no, this is not CPU related. Instead, it's GPU related. Kind of weird, isn't it? We're talking about CPUs from AMD and GPUs from uh, Intel. But this is, of course, the discrete GPU that we've heard so much about. There are two discrete GPUs that Intel are supposedly working on, or actually two discrete architectures. That's the better way to put it. One is Arctic Sound, and the second is Jupiter Sound, with Arctic Sound supposedly being released in 2020. So there is some questions regarding exactly what Intel's intent and purpose is, and perhaps we will actually find out the answers in mid-December, where the company are going to be putting on a show. They're literally going to have a conference and stream that, supposedly uh, revealing all of the information, or at least a lot of information concerning the GPU. We know that Raj Akodori, along with a lot of other heads, are going to be at this particular event. And I don't think we're going to have like, well, it has this amount of processors, this clock speed, and blah, blah, and it's going to have this pricing, because obviously it's not going to be released until 2020. My feeling, my feeling excuse me, is that instead, they're probably going to give us an overview of possibly the market segments they're going to be targeting, probably the performance levels they're going to be targeting to a degree. They're obviously not going to be like, well, in this particular game, it's going to be getting like 65 frames a second at this particular resolution. They won't do that, of course. What they probably will do instead is be like, we are going to go after high performance computing because it's almost certain that Intel are going to be targeting high performance computing. But I'm almost certain, and this is my personal feelings here, that they also will be targeting gamers as well, simply because of what we've seen from the drivers and so much other stuff. There has also been a couple of whispers in the wind telling us that the GPUs themselves will leverage the EMIB architecture to communicate to the CPU, which of course will naturally uh, be excellent for high performance computing, uh, which might 
uh, cause NVIDIA to raise their eyebrows, but of course they also have NVLink, but we don't know whether that's going to be more limited, less limited, and what the bandwidth situation is going to be like. And of course, AMD are leveraging Infinity Fabric in PCIe 4.0, which we know, of course, offers double the bandwidth compared to, um, compared to the older generation. But all of these questions are hopefully going to be answered by Intel at that event. And I, for one, really look forward to it because ultimately, even if Intel just goes for the mid-range gamers, which was another rumor, they are going to only target the mid-range. In my personal opinion, it's going to be fantastic. And the reason I believe that gamers are almost certainly going to be involved in this uh, event is because it doesn't make sense for them not to. Unless they are going for a totally different design, which is very different from all the GPUs we've seen in the past, a GPU minus some stuff, if it's really fast for high performance computing, it typically does a pretty good job at gaming. And if you were to, for example, take Quadro and you were to take GeForce, yes, there are some key differences there, like the FP64 performance and other bits and bobs as well, like, for example, high bandwidth memory in some cards and blah, 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 blah. But it's not like you can't do it, right? And NVIDIA essentially do just that. They make some concessions. They tweak this, they cut that, they reduce this, and they, you know, uh, take that away. And that makes the GeForce cards. And that, of course, is even less true now with Turing. Because if you were to take a look at, let's say, the Tensor cores, which are now um, part of the Turing architecture, they do things like deep learning, super sampling, and all of this other cool stuff. And we don't know how, of course, the future is going to evolve there and what exactly is going to remain, whether DLSS and other uh, techniques are going to be really heavily used by games developers. But my personal feeling is I believe Intel are definitely going to want in on the act with gamers because it is such a lucrative market. Speaking of gamers... Nice segue there, right? Haha, -ha, not really, but I'm going to go with it. Uh, Microsoft have, of course, acquired a lot of studios, including one of my favorite studios at the moment, Obsidian. But we also have uh, the folks who created Hellblade, uh, um, Ninja Theory, and so many other studios as well. And so there was a question, well, actually a couple of questions people had. One, why are Microsoft acquiring the studios? Two, why are the studios actually being bought? And three, what are the plans of the studios? Well, Microsoft's Mike Yubara was recently talking to a YouTuber by the name of Boogie2988. I will link his video in the description of this one out of respect to him. And he actually commented on this very topic. He essentially said that they are not offering studios a limited budget. They are basically giving them a blank check. I'm going to read out a quote verbatim. He went up to the companies and said, what project would you like to make? And they said, well, what's your budget? And he said, I don't think you understand. That is not our question. Our question is, what games do you want to make? We are Microsoft and we have the budget. We just want to know what game you want to do what are your wildest dreams? End quote. Now, I find that quote amazingly amusing for a couple of reasons. The first is that we are Microsoft. It's like, it's such a true quote. It's not even them being boastful. It's basically like saying, well, you don't really need to worry how many millions this costs because believe us, we can afford it. And it also makes me giggle because it makes me wonder exactly what these studios are going to be able to produce without needing to worry necessarily about every last penny. Of course, the reality is that if they were like, oh, well, this game's going to cost $2 trillion, obviously that's not realistic. But... And they don't have to worry about penny pinching and instead produce games that don't necessarily have to be major hits, therefore don't necessarily need to make major profits, but perhaps break even or just do enough to help Microsoft's name out, you know, get the name out there and help them sell more consoles. That would probably be enough. And it's great news for us because, well, we're PC games predominantly, I'm assuming. You might be a console gamer as well, in which case, welcome to the fold. That's amazing. But predominantly, most people watching this channel are probably PC gamers and enthusiasts, and that benefits us as well, because games will, of course, come to the PC, which I love. You know, I'm a, I'm a PC gamer. I own a PlayStation 4. I own an Xbox. I own a Nintendo Switch. But generally speaking, I do play mostly on PC. 
So either way, this benefits me, but it also means that Microsoft addressing a key weakness, and we all know what that weakness is. That's right, exclusive games. And it's like, no matter what Microsoft do with the Xbox One X, they can't get rid of the stigma that they currently have of like, well, that's great, but where are the games? And while they do have strong first party titles, personally, my, my personal opinion, you might, you might feel, you might feel differently. Like if you're, if you don't like Gears of War, if you don't like Force, if you don't like Halo and so on, well, you know, then you're not going to like the exclusive games. But to my mind anyway, I think that the console has some excellent exclusive games, but it also doesn't have enough. And having a wider catalogue of more exclusive titles is, of course, going to be critical when the Scala is released. So I am very curious to see what we see from Obsidian Entertainment, what we see from Ninja Fury, and so on and so on over the next several years. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. You can find us on Patreon, which of course is linked in the video description. If you don't want to donate, that is absolutely fine. But once again, if you do have a few spare pennies, then you can by all means use that. We also have an Amazon affiliate link. If you prefer and you need to buy some coffee for the month, well, you could use that Amazon affiliate link and it does provide us a few pennies. And once again, those proceeds are very helpful to the channel indeed. But you can also like the video and comment below what you personally are looking forward to regarding uh, the Intel discrete graphic chip because of course that helps uh, the video be promoted in YouTube and that is really helpful too. With all of that said, hopefully you have uh, enjoyed the video and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.